brachial plexus is a network arising from the anterior rami of roots C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1. At the interscalene space, these roots come together. C5 and C6 join to form the superior trunk, C7 continues to form the middle trunk, and C8 and T1 join to form the inferior trunk. These trunks are very short. Below the interscalene space, each trunk splits into a posterior division and an anterior division. These divisions then merge in the supraclavicular region and give rise to the cords. The lateral cord is formed by the joining of the anterior divisions of the superior and middle trunks. The medial cord is an extension of the anterior division of the inferior trunk, and the posterior cord is formed by the joining of all posterior branches. These cords enter the tunnel of the pectoralis minor, then the axilla, to once again branch out, giving rise to the terminal nerves. The musculocutaneous nerve arises from the lateral cord, the median nerve from the lateral and medial cords, and the ulnar nerve from the medial cord only. The posterior cord gives rise to the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. The anatomy I have just described has many variants and is present in only 60 to 75% of cases. We are now going to review the surface anatomy, which is essential to understanding medical imaging, especially ultrasound. There are five areas of interest. The first area I am going to describe is the peripheraminal region. The transverse processes you see here on C5 and C6 have a very particular shape, described by Martinelli and Bianchi. It is U-shaped, with an anterior portion and a posterior portion, between which the roots are positioned. However, starting from C7, it is different, since there is only one large posterior process, and the C7 root passes in front of it. The second area of interest is the interscalene space between the anterior scalene muscle in front and the middle scalene muscle behind. The roots, then the trunks, are arranged from top to bottom inside the interscalene space, with C5 being the most superior and most superficial. Below the space we find the subclavian artery, and behind that C8 and T1. A little further down we find the cords. Above the clavicle they are arranged in a singular triangular bundle, in contact with the outer edge of the subclavian artery. We enter the costoclavicular space and then the pectoralis minor tunnel. Here the cords are arranged according to their names around the axillary artery. The lateral cord is lateral, the posterior cord is posterior, the medial cord is medial. Below the pectoralis minor tunnel, they branch out, giving rise to the terminal branches, which we are going to describe in the technique portion of this video. I am going to show you a simplified method for examining the brachial plexus, starting from the supraclavicular fossa. The clavicle is very easy to locate, even in heavy individuals. Here you can feel it as a raised area. Positioning the transducer in this hollow, you can quite easily obtain this type of image, where you can see the subclavian artery beating at the surface of the cervical pleura. Here you will notice the first rib. All these rounded structures you see grouped together here correspond to the cords, but they are hard to distinguish. The lateral cord is located rather anterior, the posterior cord is rather lateral at this level, and the medial cord is rather posterior. Starting from the reference view on the supraclavicular fossa, and using the ski lift technique, we can follow the nerve structures and quickly reach the interscalene space consisting of the anterior scalene, here, and the middle scalene, here. You see that the roots are arranged in this space from superficial to deep. C5 is the most superficial, while C6, C7, C8 and T1 are harder to see deeper down. We are now going to follow C5, still using the ski lift technique, and approach the spine. Here is C5, in contact with the transverse process of the corresponding vertebra. The transverse process has a very particular U-shape, with an anterior portion and a posterior portion. 
Moving vertically, we come upon C6, which is in contact with its transverse process and is also split into anterior and posterior portions. It is different for C7, which has a vertebra with a single posterior portion in its transverse process. The C7 root is positioned anteriorly here. When we slide further toward the distal end, if we're lucky, we can see C8 and T1 directly in contact with the T1 vertebral body. The axial views provide the most information about the roots and trunks, and in some cases, coronal views can be used to confirm the extent of a lesion, such as this one with C5 and C6, since the transverse processes are located here. We are going to pass through the brachial plexus again, this time downward. We locate the C5 root at its transverse process. We are going to follow this C5 root, which here becomes the most superficial of the plexus, and at one point C5 and C6 are going to merge into the superior trunk, which is about here with its fascicles. Here you see a bundle splitting off. This fascicle corresponds to the suprascapular nerve, which is still lateral to the other nerve structures which you can follow quite far. Here it passes under a very noticeable landmark, the omohyoid muscle. We will now go on to the infraclavicular region. So here we follow our subclavian artery. It passes under the clavicle. An acoustic shadow prevents us from following it. We continue distally from the costoclavicular space. Here the subclavian artery becomes the axillary artery. And if we descend a little further, we come to the area of the pectoralis minor tunnel, with the pectoralis major here, the pectoralis minor, and the axillary artery here. You will notice that the cords are arranged according to their names. The lateral cord is in the lateral position, the posterior in the posterior position, and the medial bundle in the medial position. Below the pectoralis minor tunnel, the cords reorganize to give off terminal nerves. Notice here the musculocutaneous nerve, which penetrates in the coracobrachial muscle anterior to the axillary artery, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, which is medial, with the radial nerve, the most posterior. After our overview of the brachial plexus, we have a little bonus on the main cervical nerves, which is largely inspired by a very fine presentation given by Carlo Martinelli in the 2016 ISS meeting in Paris. In my demonstration, I already showed you the suprascapular nerve, which you see here, splitting from the superior trunk anterior to the middle scalene, but other nerves are also clearly visible. Here's an example of the vagus nerve, CN10, between the carotid and the jugular vein, which is very easy to see. Here is the phrenic nerve with a very clear landmark, the anterior part of the anterior scalene, the long thoracic nerve which pierces the middle scalene, and finally the accessory spinal nerve, CN11, which innervates the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius and pierces the sternocleidomastoid. Now we are going to study the smaller cervical nerves. The vagus nerve, CN10, is between the carotid artery and the jugular vein. These two vascular landmarks make it easy to spot here under the arrow, and here in a longitudinal view. I am now going to show you the phrenic nerve, which originates from C4, emerges from the interscalene space and traces a half circle here on the superficial anterior part of the anterior scalene. You see, we managed to follow it quite far. The long thoracic nerve that originates from the C5 to C8 roots has a remarkable anatomical relationship with the middle scalene. In fact, it gives rise to bundles that perforate the middle scalene. At the exit, they regroup to give rise to the long thoracic nerve, which innervates the anterior serratus. The accessory spinal nerve can be easily located at the distal end, deep in the anterior part of the trapezius. It is a small rounded structure that becomes superficial, very superficial here, as we get closer to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which we can see here. It penetrates this sternocleidomastoid muscle to innervate it. 
Here it is, deep in the muscle. Here is an example of brachial plexus damage in a patient around 30 years of age who has a deficit of the left upper limb, resulting from a knife wound. Notice that C5 root looks completely normal. Then is lost in an area of fibrous scarring, relatively smooth instead of the proximal part of the interscalene space. A bit more distally, we find the typical appearance of the trunk branches. And further down, the brachial plexus bundles in the supraclavicular region appear normal. Here is an example of long thoracic nerve damage in a patient around 20 years of age who has winged scapula, scapula alata, with gradual onset secondary to his arms stretching when he tried to rein in a horse. Here we are in the interscalene space, as I showed you before. In the middle of this space, a small nerve penetrates the middle scalene. This small nerve corresponds to the long thoracic nerve where it emerges from the middle scalene. It is clearly thickened on both the axial and sagittal views, 